thanks all, thanks all so much for uh, coming here, coming in out of the rain in the Purple Valley and to join us here today. I'm super excited to be here and to tell you about, um, about my, my group's research, um, work with my students, the sort of stuff that we study, how sticky stuff sticks and stays stuck. It takes some practice, yeah, <laughs> to say it quick. Um, and also uh, to have, give you guys this experience to sort of be back in the classroom. Um, and because I really think of, although I'm gonna tell you more about uh, my group's research than say the introductory physics class that I was lecturing uh, and working on this morning, um, this really is, I, I think, such a keystone part of the Williams experience where students can be doing cutting edge research in material science and physics in whatever their field of study is, deeply integrated with their Educa their education. And so that, that combined um, thing, I think, is something that's really special about Williams, and it's part of why I'm here. So without further ado, um, here's today's, today's project. Um, and so I'm sure you guys are familiar with sticky things, uh, from tape to small children, perhaps. Um, and, and, but I don't know if you've, if you've ever really looked closely at the back of a sticky note. You might have noticed that there's this sort of layer of this soft, squishy, sticky stuff that is, of course, what makes it stick, even to something that's not perfectly flat, like the fabric of my jacket. Now, it turns out the theories that we often still use, or that are often still used, to describe exactly how this is staying stuck to me um, were mar largely developed in the late 60s to early 70s. I think some of you are familiar with that, that time frame deeply. So right, when, when, perhaps when you were here taking your introductory physics and math or political science or whatever else um, you may have studied here. And, but they were really developed with ideas of mechanics and physics that are perhaps more relevant to traditional engineering materials like steel or rubber, um, but now we're getting used to try to understand much, much softer materials, like what's on the back of the sticky note, on the back of tape or band-aid, uh, band-aids, or uh, even things as soft as we are, trying to understand, well, you know, what is the difference in terms of both the stickiness and the squishiness of living tissues and living materials? And so the thing is that um, the, as we start to use soft materials more and more and more, um, I, my, I subtitled The Intriguing Mechanics of Soft Surfaces. As we start to worry about these interfaces and engineering on these interfaces, um, I'm not sure what happened to that other picture, but basically we're building soft robotics out of really squishy stuff. We're building new medical, medical implants that are really designed more to mimic the sort of softness and compliance of our own body's tissues as opposed to more traditional hard plastics and hard metals. And so how do we understand and engineer with those materials? Well, we need to make sure that our just fundamental physics that we understand of how they work really is accurate for those materials. And is it fair to just take sort of a theory that works for rubber or steel and say, well, it's just, it's just, it's like steel, but softer is a hint. We're not just like steel, but softer. And so what a lot of my group's research focuses on is really trying to understand what happens when materials, when solids and uh, start to be so soft, that they start to act a bit like liquids that can't flow. This is, um, and um, so we study adhesion of very, very soft uh, very soft materials. We study dynamics. We study sort of. Uh, we study how biological systems interface with well, more traditional fluids. Fluids, we, and some, sometimes I say, oh, we also study. We study solids that act like fluids that can't flow. We also study fluids that act like fluids, which sounds less exciting, but there's actually still a lot of exciting physics there. Um, a lot of dynamics and instabilities. And this sort of, just to give you a quick, sort of a quick pictorial snapshot of the scope of the work that we do, all having to do with really trying to understand what happens when the stuff that we want to interact with, the stuff that we want to engineer with, the stuff that we want to just understand in the universe is really, really soft and squishy. Um, and of course, none of this work could be done without the uh, Williams students who join my group and work and work with us. And here is a, a decent fraction of the more than 40 students who worked with me over the last six years. Um, they have just been incredible. As, as you know, Williams students are amazing. <laughs> Um, I can say that, I, can, I guess I can say that because, um, you know, I can especially say that since I myself never had the opportunity to be a Williams student, so I'm just, oh, you guys are amazing, although my little brother was, so there's a little, little bias there, maybe. Um, but yeah, but we go to, uh, so they do research in the lab, we go to conferences, we share our work all around the country at local workshops as well as at national level conferences, um, and there's a few snapshots from this summer really getting in the lab. 
um, making measure, we measure materials, we build custom apparatus and try to figure out how do we ask questions of the universe and of these soft materials um, and what's going on. We des you know, design, here's Prairie, she's design designing a new apparatus and work on theory. So we have this whole scope of things, really fundamentally trying to understand questions about soft materials and soft, particularly soft, sticky stuff. So about a third of my group's work, maybe, maybe, maybe more than that, about half, really focuses on questions of soft adhesion and soft contact. Okay, so the, for the topic of today's class, and I, I encourage you to ask questions along the way if you have them, or, or there's also time at the end, um, I want to start, start by posing, just sort of saying, okay, well, if we have a very simple, sticky experiment, and to try to just start to ask questions about, well, what's happening here? So what you're seeing is you're seeing a, a little glass sphere, um, which I, is very little. You, you could just barely see this with your naked eye if you have very good close-up vision. Um, it's about the tenth of the size of a period on the, a per like the dot at the end of a sentence on a printed page. That's about the size of this. This is with a microscope. We do a lot of microscopy and imaging and image analysis, and so you'll see some of that in this talk. Um, and what that's doing is I'm bringing it into contact with this initially flat surface, um, and just letting it stick and pulling and seeing what happens. Um, and so one quick question I have for you guys to start off with is, so that surface I'm bringing into, the con into contact with, you've had a chance to watch it stick and unstick. Not everything stays stuck, you know. Stick and unstick a few times. Um, you know, is that a solid? Is it a liquid? Is it something else? How many of you guys think it's a solid? I got a couple. How many, okay, okay. How many of you think it's a liquid? Okay. How many of you think it's, oh, I don't know. You know, so I, we're not sure, I guess. Or maybe something in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it is actually a solid. That is a truly a solid. Um, it's a very soft, squishy solid. Um, but it is, actually, it is solid and it is fully solid. But it does, for those of you who thought it was a liquid, if you, take, if, I, if you take those profiles, if you measure the shapes that it's making as you're pulling on it, quantifiably, mathematically, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So for those of you who said it was a liquid, you were just like, I, yeah, you know, good, excellent analysis. Yes, please. Can you quickly define solid? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So the question was, can I quickly define a solid? I could probably also, at very great length, design to define a solid also. Uh, yes, so, so a, a solid, is something that if I were to set it down, um, it does not over time flow, for example, under its own weight. Or if I were to put, hang a weight on it, it does not over, to, over time, um, if I put a very, very, very small weight on it, it would not just flow over time. Um, and so it's, uh, t in a technical, technical way, I would say a solid is something that has a, puts a zero frequency shear modulus, which is a, another way of, a fancier way of saying what I just said, which is that if I were to put a very small, very small force on it, even that is not enough to make it flow. There are a lot of things in this in-between that are a solid for a little bit, and then they start to flow. Mayonnaise is a great example of and shampoo and ketchup, also blood, if the things that are, actually no, blood is a, you know, sorry, blood's a sheer thinning fluid. Mayonnaise and ketchup and, and peanut butter are things, are all examples of something called a yield stress fluid, where it does actually take a little bit of initial force, but then after that, any amount of force will make it flow. Um, so I mean, a, a solid is something that basically, when, when it has a shape, it'll keep its shape. That's the sort of s a simple definition. Please. Oh, uh, yeah. Can I define it more positively? Sure. So, um, so okay, so I, I, the question was, I defined a solid as something it doesn't do. Um, what about something it does do? So a solid will, you know, will if I do, um, if I push on it on, on one side, on any side, it will, it is able to transmit, it'll transmit that force through. Um, let's see. Um, it will respond, a solid is something that has, will act like a spring in the sense that if I put a force on it, it'll go to some displacement, and if I let that go again, it should go back again. So a very simple elastic solid. Um, let's see, good questions. Um, I think I might stop there for the moment, but, but yeah, excellent, excellent questions. Something, something where the, 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 I think hopefully the intuition, your intuition about solid and, and liquid Broad, as broad categories, is, 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 you can trust it, even if your eyes may, dis, may deceive you here. 
please. It, it seems to me it's, it's deformable, but it's not flowable. It is deformable, but not flowable. Yes, yes, indeed. It does not flow. Um, yeah, with enough force, you know, anything will flow, more or less, but, but yes, it does not easily flow. Yeah, and these, are, and these are very, very soft, soft things. Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, great, okay, so, so one of the points I wanted to make here, so I mentioned I really work at this, at this place where we do have solids that start to act like liquids and that are, you know, sort of, that are very liquid-like in certain ways. And so in order to understand adhesion, which is, and how, you know, how sticky stuff sticks and stays stuck, which is the topic of today's class, we also need to understand something about how things get wet. Because fundamentally, the processes of wetting and adhesion are, are really kind of two sides of the same coin. So the agenda for today's class uh, is to talk about, you know, how do things, what makes things get wet? What is it when you talk, when I talk about wetting, which as someone from New England is actually a really hard word for me to say. I always say wetting and then people wonder who's getting married. So it's, <laughs> it's a uh, wetting um, and then I say it awkwardly. So that's my New England accent. Um, anyway, so what, you know, how do we think about wetting? How do we think about why things get wet? That's deeply related to why, what makes things sticky, um, why things adhere. And then ultimately then I wanna showcase a little bit of like, well, what, well then once you understand that, how do, what kind of new physics do we start to get from considering, looking at these materials very closely in the laboratory? Um, okay, so thing one, how do things get wet? So if you've ever taken a physics class way back, you might remember that it's always all about energy. Energy, 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 energy. Um, that the universe will spontaneously move, that you get forces that drive things towards states of lower energy. Um, if I, you know, so if I start, if I get, start with something that's high up, has a potential energy, if I let it go, it'll translate into motion towards a lower energy state. Um, things will always roll down the hill. So, energy, it's always the answer. For those of you who haven't taken a physics class, what you missed was, it's all about energy. <laughs> That's basically all you need to know. Don't tell my students, because they're doing, they, see, they feel like there's a lot more than that. Okay, so it's all about energy. And so when you see something that's getting wet, whether it's, and today's a great day for examples of this, um, really it comes down to, if you, if you look at, and something, so here's an example of a, sort of a, a, I took this picture of a flower, and you can maybe sort of see there's some raindrops on it in the background there. Um, the question of, you know, does something get wet comes down to energy. It comes down to surface energy, which we also call surface tension. So we can also similarly ask the question, well, why are drops and bubbles usually uh, round? And that's because the surface of any fluid, um, and by fluids, I mean sort of fluids and gases and so forth, anytime you have a, a surface, um, or actually of anything, even solids as well, which is where this gets really interesting, is anytime you have a surface, there's an energy associated with that surface. Um, it comes from, it's not, uh, it's a little bit complex exactly, exactly where it comes from has to do with the molecular interactions, has to do with uh, sort of chemistry, and I'm happy to, you know, take a turn into that at some point, but, um, but for the moment, sort of as a physicist, just from a high level, you can sort of say, well, there is some energy. These molecules who are at the surface don't really like, they'd rather be in the bulk. If they would rather be at a surface, you'd have just things explode. So if any time you have a, a, a droplet, so surface tension or surface energy is what tends to make things round. If you have a little drop of water, a dew drop, it tends to make it round. If you blow a soap bubble, it becomes round. It's not a square, because it, it can have less area if it's round. And so essentially then the surface energy or surface tension, quantifiably, I, you know, I, I, I was told you guys wanted that classroom experience, so there's a couple equations. <laughs> coming up, just a couple. Um, but this idea that, so, so you have the surface energy and it's a cost to make new area. And so, and you can, and you can make, here's my equation, it's equal sign, is that there's a, if you wanna change the shape of a fluid, you have to pay a cost um, in order to make, so with this, the new area here. If you can get rid of area, then you lower your energy and, and you win, so that's great. So it's a balance of energies. Now, that's just for a droplet that's floating in, the, floating in the air, and you get, you know, you get little droplets like that on a rainy day. But if you want to think about how things get wet, well, all of a sudden it gets a lot more complicated because there's more surfaces involved. So now if we take this water droplet and put it down on a surface, now there's not just the surface tension or energy of that fluid, there's also an energy of the dry solid, 
or surface tension of a dry solid, and there's a surface tension of the wet solid. So the question of wetting, and also fundamentally then the question of adhesion is, well, if the dry energy is higher than the wet surface energy, then the droplet wants to spread, and you get super hydrophilic kind of surfaces where things really, 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 really spread. And, but on the other hand, if the wet energy is really high, that's the same as me holding, my, holding the thing really high up, um, and you can, you can get rid of that energy by staying dry, then you get like a hydrophobic or super hydrophobic surface where the things tend to ball up. And you see that often, a lot of plants have a bit of a waxy coating and they have texturing as well. There's a beautiful, whole beautiful area of study into the, really the physics of how things uh, don't get wet, uh, but that's maybe a story for another day. But here, here what we can understand is that you know, when you're in contact with the surface, then there, there's some kind of a balance. And a lot of times, and you should try this at home, if you take water droplets or you take a mister and you spray water on all sorts of different surfaces, um, you can see that they tend to, make, uh, tend to make something with a little angle here. And that tells you that's a way of quantifying the wettability of a surface. How hydrophobic or hydrophilic, if you're talking about water, is it? Okay, so. Here's another little throwback. So physics is all about energy, but it's also about forces. So energy is number one, force number two. And so what we can do is we can kind of zoom in to right at that contact and ask the question, will it spread or will it ball up or will it do something in between by really just considering a, a force balance. If we say, okay, well, we have this ten wet tension pulling this way, dry, dry uh, surface energy or surface tension pulling that way, and the fluid surface tension pulling the other way, we get a balance of forces that's trying to move and equilibrate where that line is. Um, that sets an angle, which, which ultimately we can use to characterize the characterize a surface. Um, and that's something we standardly use. For those of you who love equations, here's number two. Um, and, but the key takeaway here, so this is really just a, just a balance of the, these tensions are pulling towards, towards me, the dry tension is pulling the other way, and Ultimately, what this tells you, the takeaway here, is that the energies of a surface and the, and the fluid that you're trying to put in contact with it for wetting all determine a contact, and determine a contact angle and determine how things spread. Okay, so what does this have to do with things sticking to things? Because now I'm, I have things getting wet. Well, we can flip the thing on its head also and think about, well, what if instead of putting a droplet on a surface, instead I think about putting a surface on a droplet? which is to say, what if I think about putting little particles, say little spherical particles, onto a fluid surface? This is a process called adsorption, uh, with a D, adsorption. Um, and it's actually a really, 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 really industrially important process. A lot of our process uh, foods and foams and, um, and cosmetic products use this kind of process to help to stabilize, stabilize surfaces in, uh, in materials. Again, that's another tangent perhaps for a, for a q and if you'd like. But, um, but this is a really, really important process. And it's, but it's exactly the same as what I just showed you, except now that's where the contact angle is. So here's our dry, here's our wet, here's our fluid surface tension. And what we get then um, is we get that even particles of different sizes will always kind of sit in a Goldilocks way. They'll sit kind of, well, this one sits here, and this one sits here, and this one sits here. So they always make the same geometry relative to the surface. There's a couple other reasons why this is important, and the reason I'm telling you about it is one, when you see particles sticking to a surface like this, you know that the physics that's most important is a fluid-like physics, or is fluid or capillary physics, is surface tension physics. Um, and the other thing is it's actually, we, we are doing a bunch of other studies in my lab um, uh, so I want to tell you today mostly about adhesion and stuff sticking together, but a bunch of our fluid-related projects actually have to do with systems that are interacting where we have particles on a surface that interact in different ways. And just to show you a couple quick examples of that, on the left, what you see is a little, um, a, uh, is a little cup on the surface on the, or the, the top of a liverwort plant, a Marcanthia polymorpha. It's one of the very earliest land plants um, and this may seem like a big you know, turn from physics that I'm studying 
a, a plant. Um, but it turns out this plant does really, really cool capillary physics. It also was historically very important as one of the first land plants. It was so successful in taking over land um, that it, uh, and drew down so much carbon dioxide that it's believed to have caused a mini ice age. So this little plant and its close relatives completely changed the climate of the Earth a long time ago. Um, and we're still, understand, we're still using it as a model system to understand sort of the evolution of modern plants. Um, also, it does some really neat capillary physics. When it reproduces, it makes these little particles. These guys are about half a millimeter across, so they're about the same size as a, as a dot on a printed page. And uh, we see them interact on the surface via these sort of adsorption capillary forces. And we're trying to understand whether or not the plant may have evolutionarily engineered itself to use that in its reproduction. Um, so maybe a story for another time, but super, super interesting. We're also been looking at, so we had some field work looking uh, in, at the Matanuska Glacier in Alaska, which seems a very far away from, from, very far away maybe from my sticky note, but there's this really, really interesting phenomenon that has been observed for decades, but never explained, um, that when you touch the surface of the water, the surface of the water has this black layer, which we've identified to be carbon particles um, through analysis here back here at Williams, of samples that we brought back here to Williams. And when you touch it with your finger, but not a rock or a stick, you get these beautiful exploding starbursts. And that's something that has been known since uh, for decades, but no one had ever explained before. And it's, and it's really a question of surface tension and surface fl flows induced by surface tension changes. Um, and so, the, so we've been looking into that and other related things as well. Um, and the other thing is, so if you not happen to be in Alaska or looking around for little plants, um, you can also experiment with these surface tension forces and particle adsorption at home. Um, because even when you have an object that's a lot heavier than water, you can still sometimes get it to float if it's partially wetting. And I, and I mentioned that term on the previous slide. Partially wetting just means that the surface, that balance of energies, it wants to be partially wet. It's a very technical field, partially wetting, partially wet. And so what you get then is you can float things even that are quite heavy because surface tension holds them up, and then you get these really interesting long-range forces and torques um, that can occur between things. So, so uh, basically everything I'm showing you, you know, tr try it at home. Yeah. I, always, I always tell my students, try it at home, and also when we do, when we do lab safety, you know, we have all the formal lab safety, and then it's just like, look, you could probably eat just about anything in the lab, but don't, you know, it's not a, just don't, you know, why, don't eat plastic, that's the, um, so I have a very safe lab. Um, okay, okay, so <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so now you have a sense, hopefully, of why it is things get wet, and if nothing else, hopefully you'll go out into the world and, and notice, all the drop, notice all the drops and think, oh, that's a more wetting surface, and that's a more, hydro that's a more hydrophobic surface, and I could measure that angle and say something about the balance of energy, so you're ready. Um, but I want to get back also now to, okay, so how does that relate to why things are sticky? And to be sticky, you need two, there's two steps to being sticky. One has to do with energy, again. Um, and really, it's the same idea, except now we're going to sort of bring together two materials. But it's really basically the same I exact idea as wetting, where I say, well, I have one material and I have another material, and I have some, you know, some interface between them, and I have a choice, or the material has a choice, the universe has a choice. Do we keep those materials separate, or do we bring them together, get rid of these surface tensions, and trade them for this, this uh, gamma one to a surface or interfacial tension or interfacial energy instead. And if it lowers the energy of the system to create that interface, to trade the free surfaces for the interfacial one, then that's a win and the everything, and you will want to stick. If it doesn't, if that's not a win, then things are not sticky to each other. Um, as an aside, we, uh, our skin oil is a, pretty low, is a pretty low surface energy. That's part of why we're not that sticky. So you don't go around sticking to everything around you, um, which is good. I mean, I think that's overall a, a, useful, a useful property since we're not, you know, we're not gecko-like in our day-to-day in our -day behavior. Or at least I'm not. I mean, if you are, that's amazing. But um, yeah, so generally speaking, we don't, you know, we don't stick to stuff. Um, uh, and, so, and so you can define, just like we did before with the sort of energies, you can define an adhesion energy per area. Um, this might be the second to last equation here, which just really just go, go, ends up boiling down to say this W is a measure of how sticky the energies are. If W is high, then things really want to stick together. If W is low, things don't want to stick together. If W is negative, they just 
you have to really smush them together, and they're still not going to be sticky. They're just going to tolerate it. <laughs> okay, so that's the key, the key takeaway. So I want you to understand what W means. So the problem is that physicists really can only draw, well, basically we can draw two to three shapes. So here I've drawn shape one, which is the fl straight line. Um, we sometimes we can combine straight lines to make boxes or inclined planes, you know, wedges, things like that. Um, but the other thing that we can do is, uh, the thing is, so this is great if you, if you can make the contact area, and if things are perfectly straight and flat, that's easy to do. But if they're not perfectly straight and flat, say one side is round, this is the second shape physicists can draw circles. I went over this with my class this morning. The kidney bean is our third shape. That won't come up today, that's advanced. Um, <laughs> That's, for, that's the shape for every other shape. Um, but circle, and so the thing is, yeah, you try to bring these guys together, and, and you can't actually make any contact area, which means that you can't, even, though, even if things, that, that W, the energies, make them really, 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 really want to stick, they can't, unless one or the other side can compromise in its shape and change its shape in order to meet, meet halfway. Um, and so that's what... And so soft materials, and by soft here, this is even, and I said, these theories were originally developed for things like rubber. Um, this is really important for the tires on your car to be able to grip a road. It needs to be at least a little bit soft to be able to wrap around the fact that a road is not flat. And so you can get these, you can get the, the things can wrap to create more contact area, but this costs energy. Not surface energy in this case, or in the case of an elastic solid, but it costs, it costs elastic energy. It's like stretching a spring. It's like trying to reach around something. And so, the, and so we have this question now with very soft materials. Going back to our initial simple sticky experiment, are they more like capillary wetting, like liquids adsorption particles sticking to a fluid, or are they more like a tire gripping a road? Are they more like sort of classic solid adhesion? Um, it turns out, we can tell experimentally, we can make, we can do the experiment, and we do this experiment in my lab regularly, um, and because, there's, because we would get, we make a different prediction depending on whether or not, uh, which type of uh, adhesion we have, whether it's more capillary-like adhesion or it's more solid-like adhesion. And so if it's more capillary-like adhesion, well, you expect the adhesion to look a lot like that particle adsorption that I showed you before, that is to say, you sort of, you adhere to, towards a fixed contact angle, and that's geometrically equivalent, for those of you who love geometry. My students always ask, what kind of math do I need to study to do physics? And I was like, you know, I tell them, and then I say, but I do a shocking amount of geometry, so <laughs> practice that. Um, so the geom geometrically having a fixed contact angle is actually exactly the same as having a fixed proportion of how deep, if you measure how deep did this sphere go into the surface from the top, compared to its radius. So even though the littler ones, you know, don't go in as far, it's like a Goldilocks thing. They just, they go in sort of just right, each one. So one way to tell if you have capillary adhesion would be if you have an indentation depth that's just, the linear is directly proportional to the size. On the, on the flip side, um, if you have more, cla this more classic rubber-like adhesion, it's this more complex competition between adhesion energy trying to drive as much contact area as possible and elasticity trying to pull that back. And at the end of the day, um, it turns out that that spontaneous indentation depth is still related to the size of the particle for a fixed adhesion, and this is the equation. Um, I think this is the last equation. Um, and, but, and just mo mo the most important part here, it was proportional to W, which you know, so the stronger the adhesion, the more it sticks, E and U are two material properties that have to do with the stiffness of the material, how, how hard is the rubber essentially, but the most important part is here. It's not D is proportional to R, it's D is proportional to R to the one-third power. So if we do the experiment where we take a soft material, we sprinkle little dots on it so it looks like the night sky in Williamstown. It always looks like this, you know, basically. Yeah. Always clear in Williamstown, except for today. Um, so we, we put, sprinkle these little, sort of make it look like the night sky, and then we put little spheres on it. So this is experimental data from a couple of my students. And then we use a three-dimensional microscope, a type of three-dimensional microscope called a confocal microscope to scan from the bottom to the bottom to the top so we can look and see, okay, when there's a sphere attached that looks like a black hole here, uh, when there's a sphere attached, where is the surface? And so what you're watching now is a movie that's scanning from down, 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 down. And as soon as it hits the surface under the sphere, you can see these dots. Here's the plane. 
and then you see it's pulled up a little bit. Now it's going to go back down. So there's a little bit of a ridge right around the particle. You see the starry night, and then as it sweeps back down, you see all these little dots coming to the very bottom. And so you're seeing each of these yellow layers drawn here, scanning up and down. Um, and what this lets us do then is to make a quantitative measure of, well, what is that relationship between depth and size? Um, and here's what we get. So here is a summary of a lot of different experiments, um, some from a col collaborator, some from me, um, looking at, and what I have plotted here is the indentation depth versus the size. So up and to the right is stiffer materials, more rubber-like materials, and larger sized spheres. Down and to the left is the really soft, small, squishy stuff. And you see a real transition between the rubber-like adhesion to the capillary-like adhesion. And so the key takeaway here is that soft materials exhibit what has come to be called over the last 10 years the elastocapillary physics, which is to say they actually act both like liquids and solids kind of at the same time. And depending on exactly how stiff it is and exactly what size scale you're working on, um, this can be actually, solids can actually be dominantly capillary, experience dominantly capillary physics, even though they're still not flowing. They're not fluids. Um, and so what this means is that surface tension is really, really important for a lot, of, a lot of things where we, don't, we wouldn't have necessarily thought about it before. Now, if you're starting to worry about whether you're, you suddenly need to, you know, you're building a, a car or a bridge or something, uh, you don't need to worry about elastic capillary physics. For things like steel, you have to worry about quantum mechanics before you have to worry about elastic capillarity. But for things that are soft, like a soft jello, like our foods, like a lot of our commercial and industrial adhesives, like as soft as we are soft, that's exactly the right range where you start to get these kinds of things appearing on easily microscopic and even sometimes visible to the eye length scales. Um, and so the last things I want to do is just show you guys a few of the examples of work, of research that, um, that I've been working on that taps into sort of the weird physics you get from these, uh, from these situations. So one, so sort of as an example one, you can make composite materials with holes in them and where um, usually you would think, oh, if I take a material and I take, put holes in it, it's going to get easier to stretch. It's going to get weaker. But every time you create a hole, you create a surface. Every time there's a surface, there's surface tension. And so then now all of a sudden these holes, they're kind of acting like, like dew drops. You know, they're trying, they want to stay round. And it turns out that when you have stiff, stiffer materials, so it's a stiff sort of rubbery silicone, um, and you put holes in them, uh, you get softer and softer and softer like you'd expect. But if you take a very soft silicone, it does the opposite. It actually stiffens the material. So you can take away material but make it stronger. And that also means, in principle, you could, if you make the holes just the right size or the material just the right softness, you'd squeeze it and you wouldn't know the holes were there at all. Which would be an example of something uh, you might call mechanical cloaking. You could hide something in a material and you, at least by feel, you'd never know it was there. So that's pretty neat. Um, we also see that Oh, in my lab, so this is work from a whole bunch of students, um, we, we've been making little gel microspheres, a few hundred micrometers across, again, kind of just barely visible to the naked eye, the from that are stiffer to softer, and we see that they transition from being more like kind of a rubber ball that's a bit sticky to something that really looks like a fluid droplet, but yet it's still solid, and it's, and it's really existing in this intermediate of this elastocapillary physics. And you might wonder, well, you know, okay, well, why, why, do, why would I care about little sticky spheres stuck to a surface? But if you've ever looked at the back of a sticky note, as I asked you, and you've really, really looked at the back, like taking it down to our electron microscope here on campus, that's what it looks like. And so what you have, um, you have these beautiful, so you can see the, the cellulose fibers of the paper, and then all of these little sticky microspheres, which, are, which we're finding in our research that the elastocapillary nature of their adhesion lets the big ones and the small ones work together to create a more uniform adhesion over a larger area, which we think is pretty cool. Um, we wrote a paper a couple years ago, I think you read, you read the title of it um, just a couple years ago, about the dynamics of adhesive detachment. You know, watch out, you'll miss it. Um, so the very, very final moments of detachment and reincorporation. So here's this is a high-speed video of when you're unsticking something, how it how that last little point finally lets go and recovers. And it turns out to be a little space-time singularity. 
Now, there are much more famous space-time singularities, like the Big Bang, for example. Um, singularities abound in physics. Um, they happen in electromagnetism. They happen at the beginning of the universe. And I'm not saying that every time you unstick a sticky note, you're creating a new universe. But what if? You know, that'd be cool. But, but it does have hallmarks of, of these types of processes, um, which was really, really interesting from a fundamental physics view, and also gave us insights about how that thing was recovering, that it's actually, it's the, it's the surface tension of this adhesive that is forcing it back in those early times um, that turns out to be most important. And finally, some of the projects we're working on right now are looking at um, the dynamics of adhesive attachment. So what you're looking at here, you should imagine you are the adhesive, and you're looking up, and there's this giant sphere, well, giant from, from your perspective on a microscope, it's actually very small, but the giant sphere coming, coming down, and then coming, 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 and making an initial contact. And this is another high-speed video where we're trying to understand, well, what about when you first stick? What's the physics there? What governs how quickly, and how quickly and effectively you can make an adhesive contact? And this is starting to give us some information where we can measure, just measure simple things like, well, okay, well, how big is the contact as a function of time? But just this summer in my lab, we finished building uh, an, what's called a, a linic interference microscope. And what that lets us do, what you see here, what that lets us do is it lets us take high-speed three-dimensional images, which is quite hard to do, um, and we get pictures that look something like this, where this is, this is actually a, a film of isopropyl alcohol evaporating just as a tester. But what you get is you get a microscope picture, but then you get these dark lines that are effectively contour lines. Just like, you know, for example, contour lines on our favorite, the mountains, the mountains. Um, but but, it's, uh, but, you, but then let, that lets you then get a relief then of what's happening out of plane. And when we apply that to our adhesive contact, a contact uh, picture is what you can see is that as we go, now we, can, now we can take videos of that contact initiation where we actually see on a nanometer level how is the surface evolving on, uh, or all around. So it's like watching Mount Greylock shooting out of the surface, except if it did it at a less than a second and it was five micrometers tall and no one would go hiking there. But anyway, okay, so I just wanted to showcase a few of these examples from the lab where we're, explore, we're really starting to explore what is happening with these surface physics. You know, what's happening when in both in adhesion, and then I had a chance to show you a little bit of, some, a little bit of the fluid stuff we're working on with the, um, and really we're working at this interface, no pun intended, of wetting, adhesion, of solids, and fluids, and, and trying to understand and explore new physics, but also new physics that's relevant to engineering, um, engineering to biology, um, and to other processes um, at, this, at these interfaces. Um, and so with that, I want to thank all of you for your attention, but welcome more questions. Um, also, just thank, just thank again uh, my students uh, who have done so much uh, over the last several years to continue you pushing this world forward and sharing it with the world. So uh, thank you all. Do, do I get to call or? Yeah, okay, please. So, um, hey, oh, can I use the microphone? Oh, sure. Okay. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So the opposite side of the coin, non wetting. Yeah. Um, Rain X. Yep. Uh, sprays to keep our clothes from getting wet in the rain, um, biomaterials for prosthetics mm -hmm. to prevent adhesion of thrombi and, and medically, that sort of thing. <clears throat> What's the common denominator for these, these materials? Yeah. Yeah, so many of those materials are working with that, that W, the energy parameter that, that, I, that I mentioned. So the Rain-X in particular, um, as well as the, the materials for the sort of anti-adhesion, um, many, so I, well, really it comes back to those two things, right? Can you both do the energies favor adhesion and can you get, is the shape okay? Can you get the two shapes to be conformal to each other and actually make good contact? get into all the nooks and crannies. Anti-adhesive surfaces, also anti-icing surfaces, because that's a similar, and anti-wetting, they're all um, hydrophobic, they all are really trying to leverage both of those angles. So the first thing is to try to get the surfaces, in terms of the energies, to dislike each other as much as possible. That's why if you think about things like, uh, like a lot of plastics, like Teflon has an extremely low surface energy, it loves to be by itself. It doesn't, things don't stick to it very well. 
Metals have very high surface energy. They wet very, very easily, typically, um, unless they have a coating. Um, and so, and the things like, things like Rain-X are essentially putting an additional layer on your, on your glass windshield. We actually we have some in the lab for a, there's one experiment we're doing right now to try to actually measure how random is rain, which sounds like a very esoteric and maybe even philosophical question, but it's actually really important in trying to understand processes of erosion, of fungal pathogen dispersal, and also for these plants of how how ultimately their reproductive material is, is transported. So we were trying to ask those questions and we realized we needed to know something about the randomness of rain. So anyway, we have rain X to tr for our rain box that's, that's probably right now watching the rainfall um, and taking video and analyzing that. But, but so, the, so the first thing is to try to engineer the, the surface energies to get that W term as low as possible. The other is texturing. And a lot of the, a lot of the um, particularly the clothing, uh, some of the, there's a product called Never Wet, which we also have in the lab that makes kind of a, it looks cloudy when you spray it on. You don't necessarily want a cloudy surface for like your windshield, for example. But a lot of times, a lot of super hydrophobic surfaces take advantage of surface texturing also, basically having very, very fine bumps. The early research in this was inspired by the lotus plant, which has these very, very fine waxy bumps on it. And what that essentially does is it, if something's trying to stick, even if it's a fluid, it's very hard for it to get into a little nook and cranny because it has to really squeeze in there. And, uh, and so you get, you get anti-wetting and anti-adhesion also from texturing. So some of it is trying to prevent that as well. Um, and so those are, th and, and in terms of things growing, cells growing, when there's other, there's potentially other things to try to discourage a cell, but those are the two main things. So it really is exactly what I was telling you. I mean, those are the two things you need to stick. Um, and if you can eliminate, get them as bad as possible, then you can avoid sticking. Charging is a big issue too for some, some contexts. It turns out in space applications, um, very ionized dust is a big problem. And so then you're trying to get rid of, you're trying to get rid of attraction due to charging. But that sort of goes into the W thing as well. Yeah. Um, I remember reading at some point that the discovery of the glue for a sticky note was a total accident by someone who was actually trying to develop a very strong glue, and that just seems so weird to me <laughs> that, that that would have happened. Um, they should have taken your course, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and actually, I, I have learned a lot. So the, I, I, you mentioned, mentioned at the beginning that I'm part of the Adhesion Society, which is a real thing. I, I have to tell my students that sometimes, that the Adhesion Society is a real thing. Um, but that particular society is about 40% industrial, 40% academic, and maybe 20% academic uh, government research. You know, na national labs, the National Institute of Science and Technology, NASA, people who care a lot about adhesion problems. Um, and, uh, and so I've, I've had a chance to chat with some of the folks from 3M. I also got a very hard time when they discovered I had some knockoff post-its in my bag. Um, ever since then, it's, it's the real thing. It's the real thing. Davey Russo, if you're out <laughs> there. Um, man, I, I, I got some flack for that. But, but, uh, but yeah, no, the engineering of adhesives is incredible. And it's, people sometimes ask me, well, what makes a good glue? Or what makes a good adhesive? Um, and well, and really it depends on what you're trying to do. If you want something like a post-it that will stick a few times, that will stick and then you can take it off and it won't leave any residue behind. That's very different than if you're trying to, you know, I don't know, hang, like hang something above me that will not going to fall and squish me. Or making composite materials for the, the F1, uh, so the Formula One race cars are largely composites. They're not riveted together. They're much lighter and stronger to be glued together. Um, but that's a, that's a very, you don't want that to unstick like a, like a post-it. So, so really the range of things you can discover. I have also heard, I haven't, I, I don't know for sure about that story, um, but I have heard something actually about the subsequent development from the 3M folks, which is that they're, once they discovered this adhesive that was not, you know, not too ta tacky, but not too tacky, um, their original, they were like, we can make a product of this. We'll make a bulletin board that you can just stick paper to. That was product one. The problem is it gets dirty. And it's, once it's dirty, you know, then there's something else in between you and the adhesive that's probably stuck in a reasonably well, and so you have to throw out your bulletin board. And then someone else is like, wait, we'll put it on the paper and we'll sell billions of them. <laughs> and they were right. So, so that's a follow-up follow story directly from 3M uh, about the discovery of that. But the engineering of adhesives, it's, it is, it's a complex 
uh, a definitely complex thing. And I, I've been gratified occasionally to have someone from an adhesives company come up to me at a conference and say, oh, that thing you talked about at this conference last year, it explains all this weird things we were say, seeing, and, and not just with silicones, which is the materials I mostly work with, but with these other materials too. And I said, oh, like what? And he said, I can't tell you. <laughs> And I said, well, is there anything you can tell me? He's like, no, just keep it up. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Direction is always welcome. Anyway, so, so but the interactions with, with commercial uh, companies has, has been fascinating. And, um, uh, and definitely, you know, I, I like working on physics that is, I mean, physics is amazing because it can be as big as the, the biggest thing we can possibly imagine, you know, the universe, or as small as the smallest things we can possibly imagine. And the physics that I do is, is really the physics of, of every day. It's at this length scale, this time scale, um, and, and I like that. I like that connection uh, for me and, and for my students. There's a question over here. So, so and the breathe, the breathe right strips I use take off some of my skin on my nose. Oh, yeah. So is that, a, is, that, is that a function of the change in the skin as a response to being in contact with the adhesive, or is it a change to the, because it, it, or is it a product defect? How do, would you explain that it doesn't yeah. work the way it's supposed to? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the kinds of adhesive, the particular polymer material, I've asked the folks at 3M a similar question. So, the, so the, 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 fo the, the stuff that's on the back of a typical Band-Aid or typical traditional medical adhesives, um, it's a fairly inexpensive material to produce, which is why it's mass produced like that. But one of the issues with these particular acry ac acrylic polymer um, adhesives is that over time, as they're stuck to your skin, they, they get stickier. So the molecules actually, and it's not, it's not a, a fundamental chemical change, is that the molecules change their shape and their orientation, so they make better and better and better contact with your skin. It's a little bit like the shape, the shape thing, where they're, they're getting better and better and better contact, and so consequently it sticks more and more the longer you leave it on. So if you ever, you know, you know, you know when, you, when you first put a Band-Aid on, you can kind of move it around, and then after a day it's gonna hurt <laughs> to take it off. Um, that, that's because of this reorganization. It can also be that if that particular adhesive is trapping moisture or trapping uh, or not letting your skin breathe enough, it can also cause damage to the skin below, which, which would indeed, as you pointed out, cause a weakening of the skin. Um, there are newer adhesive technologies, some of them are silicone-based, so near, to my, near and dear to my heart, that don't have the same problem, um, that are, they're more expensive to produce, so we're probably not gonna replace all of our Band-Aids with, uh, so, but you can, you can buy now um, uh, sort of gentle skin medical tapes that, that, can, that are permeable to air, air and water, which means that they don't trap moisture, they're not as damaging to skin, um, and they don't get stickier the longer you wear them. So as soon as, I, as, soon as this pro one of the products was out, I got some and I stuck it to my arm for a couple of days just to see, um, because I'm an experimental scientist, I guess, and, uh, and, and it came off just the same. So it could be that there's a better product for you. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor, so this, I mean, I am a doctor, but not that kind of, I'm not, I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah, but, but, but so there may, be, there may be a better adhesive for a particular skin, um, and there certainly are big, some of the big pushes in medical adhesive development is in indeed exactly this problem of not wanting to damage the skin, especially when you need something to be applied and applied and applied, whether it's for someone who's needing a lot of, uh, you know, bandage changes because they've had a significant, uh, uh, significant injury or surgery or, or burn, or it's moving towards wearable technologies where you want to be able to like, you know, stick your watch and your monitors or whatever onto you and walk around and then take them off every day. Um, that's a more fun application, I guess, but yeah, thank you. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, adhesion. Um, how do you relate what you've been talking about to epoxies, mm -hmm. polymerization, and, and, and that sort of adhesion. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, if I might summarize your question, it's a little bit about glues versus, glue versus the post-it, or a Band-Aid, and things like that. So there's, there's really two, I mean, maybe there's more than this, but, but in this conversation, there's two classes of adhesive, there's glues, and there's what are called pressure-sensitive adhesives, which is, which is, so pressure-sensitive adhesives is any adhesive that you press to make it stick. Oh, I didn't press on the sticky part. 
you press to make it stick. Okay, um, and essentially it's going to stick. It's but it but it won't stick unless you to, you sort of help it get into the nooks and crannies of what you're what you're look, what you're working on. It won't so it won't stick particularly well. So you got to press it to make it stick. Pressure sensitive. Glues are different. So so this material when I put it on and take it off, it might be a little bit dirty, but fundamentally chemically in terms of its how dry or wet it is, it's exactly the same as it was before. So pressure sensitive adhesives on bandages, on tapes, on uh, any kind of sort of sticker kind of things, those don't, the, the, you're not having any kind of real change to the material. Epoxies, Elmer's glue, anything that is a glue is something that starts out as a liquid, and the way that works is it's a liquid that really wants to wet. So the liquid wets into your surface, and then it goes, undergoes some kind of a transformation to become a solid. Once, and once it becomes a solid, now it is reached in and interlocked and wrapped around the fibers of your paper or the nooks and crannies of the, of the, of the wood, and so you get a mechanical interlock. The glue isn't sticky after it's dried. Epoxy is not sticky after it's cured. So in epoxy, it's a chemical reaction with like uh, Elmer's glue or something like that. It's drying, um, um, but, but, that, but that's really the difference is then pressure sensitive adhesives are always sticky. Um, they don't change fundamentally. Whereas glues and epoxies undergo this, li they liquid, they're liquid, they wet, and then they stick because they become a solid that's, that's permanently entangled with whatever you're putting it against. Yeah, great question. People ask me what kind of glue they should buy, and I'm like, I'm also not that kind of scientist. <laughs> yeah. Ma magnetism? Yes. So is it stuck? Oh, so, so could I, could I, so, hmm. Could you repeat the question? Oh, yes, of course. So the question was, uh, how can I explain magnetism? I think actually maybe the question was, well, okay, uh, so, or, or uh, maybe the question is, do I think, are magnets sticky, I guess, is a, is a, is a thing. That's, that's a very interesting question. So when I talked about the energies and so forth, uh, I mentioned that the fundamental, well, what gives you different surfaces and surface, surface energies and surface tension comes from molecular chemical level interactions. Usually we're thinking about things like hydrogen bonding, van der Waals bonding, some, sometimes covalent bonding. Um, People don't talk very much about magnetic bonding in that context. So I, th I think if I were pressed, which I am in this moment, um, I would say I would say that I, I would think about I would I would sort of mentally try to fold in. Can I think about the magnetism? If I really was forced to think about it as adhe in adhesion, that I could make an argument for it being another thing that would contribute to an effective uh, energy between the two. Um, but. He's increasing the, yeah, it has to do with, it, it would be increasing the interaction energy, so it would be part of that part. Um, I don't see that very, come up very often, so I'm not sure, um, but. Correct, that's true. You don't need, in that case, the surfaces to deform to each other, because you have a long range uh, magnetic interaction, similar to how you might have a long range electrostatic interaction between two things. So I guess there are different ways of attaching things to each other. Um, Usually, usually with adhesion, we're focused on the, uh, those very, very close, like the surface, surface layers, molecular interactions yielding this, the surface energy. Um, I don't know if I would call it adhesion, yeah. Oh, sure, sure, you can, you can, take, uh, you can take magnetic particles and, and throw it into a, into a soft, squishy rubber, and there you go, you've got a, and you can buy, the, there's those like, the somebody or others, Aaron's magic, some things that come in a tin. I've seen these for sale where it's, it's, like, a, it's like basically silly putty with magnetic particles in it. And so you can, you can put it and put a magnet and just watch it crawl slowly towards the, that sort of thing. Because it's, it's a weird viscoelastic fluid. So it's, it's like silly putty. It can bounce, but it can also flow. And you can flow. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron's magic something or other. And this, obviously, I'm not a salesperson for this thing because I, I don't know the name of the product. Um, but uh, that's an interesting question. I think... Uh, a little bit of a pathological question, also, but, <laughs> but as a, a tech, to use a somewhat technical term, but yeah, um, but yeah, you can have soft materials with magnets. I would it essentially would enhance your adhesion. It would it would com I think it would add to your adhesion energy interaction. But it, you, again, in that case, you could stick without needing the surfaces to stick uh, or to conform. That's an interesting question. I have a question about a specific slide. Can you scroll oh, sure. back? Of course. It's about 10 back. Um, keep going. Yep, that oh. was it. Oh, you yep. like the graph? Okay. That's it. Okay, the graph. So. Not letting you 
you are describing a curved line approximating yep. them by two different linear yes linear lines different different describing two different states yes well you could create a an equation that is one equation for the whole thing is there such a material oh uh sure so so okay and then, okay so I, I, I skimmed over a lot of the analysis that goes into this, of course. Um, but yeah, so, so indeed, as you, as you pointed out, the, the sort of straight line at the upper right is sort of the, is the extreme of something that's purely, uh, purely a, a elasticity versus adhesion, and, ca and surface tension doesn't matter. The bottom left would be approaching towards the capillary limit of true particle adsor liquid-like adsorption. If you, if you look closely, you see there's a dashed line connecting those. Uh, that's, actually a theory, that's actually a theoretical fit to an equation that just incorporates all of the different pieces of it. And essentially, what it is an equation that comes from thinking about the energy, simultaneously thinking about the energy of, you need of adhesion energy trying to make as much contact area as possible, and both elasticity and surface tension trying to prevent that surface from changing shape. So that's where that dashed line comes from. Um, now you point out, you, you point out correctly that sort of I, I, the, I have on the right the key to the different colors that refer to different sort of underlying stiffnesses of material. And essentially, so I guess I don't know of, a sing, of, of one single experiment um, that used a single material and really captured all the way across from the pure capillary to the pure elastic dominated regime, but there's no reason you couldn't, well, there's no reason theoretically you couldn't accept that you start to get other physics happening if you try to push in those extremes a little bit too much. So if I took this really, really, really soft material, in principle, theoretically, all I would need to do is use really big spheres, but then gravity starts to matter, which uh, no one's asked about it, but all of these experiments are done on a size scale where gravity makes no difference, essentially. All of the other forces are much heavier. Um, same thing with uh, if I took that really stiff material and I just put a really, really, really small sphere on it um, and, and it would roughly need to be, then I should get into the capillary regime, but for something like, rubber, like a rubber eraser kind of stiffness, which is kind of what that, what that highest uh, upper right red, uh, if you can see it, on the, it's a little hard to see, but the upper right is, is like a rubber eraser kind of stiffness, but I need something that's on the order of like five nanometers. I need to be able to measure a sphere that's like five nanometers, which is too small for me to see in an optical microscope. So, so I think the answer is yes, I believe the physics, complete, you know, the physics spans and holds, but experimentally it's not very, it's, it's sort of inaccessible with a single material to get a big enough size range of the spheres that we need to see all the way to both extremes. What we do see is that the, in that central region, which is where I tend to work, we definitely can see the, co the competition between the two regimes. We're, not, we're in neither extreme, but we, we see that kind of bridging region. And so we, I try to work as much as possible in the bridging region so that we can explore that competition between these different physics. Um, so it's a bit of a longer answer to your question, but it's, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a different type of a question. First of all, I want to thank you for the most uh, fascinating physics uh, lesson that I think I've ever had. This bears no resemblance to the course that I recall when I took Physics 101 as a pre-med student. My question for you is, how do you teach your uh, pre-med Physics 101 uh, students now who are not interested in, in, a, in a career in, in, in applied physics down the line? Right. Uh, uh, right. How do you keep them entertained and uh, uh, what is the motivation? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, one of my very favorite classic, I, classic physics books, well, I found a, a physics textbook that had been my grandfather's, and the, the preface to the student actually says, you will not find this book entertaining, <laughs> which, which perhaps reflects a, a 1950s kind of attitude towards uh, towards physics education. Um, I, d I do think it's challenging, right? Because you, you, there is there's a certain, um, there is a rigor to the topic. There's a, there is a it's a quantitative field. And on the one hand, you need people to sort of be able to understand and calculate and to, to interpret graphs, to understand and, and make quantitative predictions about what's happening in, in the real world. Um, and on the other hand, you know, you want them to remember what they learned. You want, I was just actually at lunch having a conversation with a, with a math professor and we were 
uh, we were recalling sort of, you know, what did we remember from 20 years ago math and physics classes, respectively? And, and it was those, those moments of, of humor, of, of, of something, you know, surprising, something like that. So to try to work those in, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a, a balancing act. Um, I personally uh, am currently teaching the, uh, the calculus-based introductory physics, which tends to be some pre-med students, but mostly prospective majors. Right across the hall go is going on the, uh, the, the algebra-based, um, more geared towards the pre-medical students. And I, I think we really do, we try to make uh, more and more to make, to try to figure out how to, how to tie things in, in both classes, really. What's relevant to your everyday life? Um, what's, uh, you know, this isn't just 400 years old physics. This really is present in day-to-day. In, in the topic of friction came up in just in discussion with my class today, and I said, well, you know, hang tight, we'll get there soon, but that is an open field. I mean, despite the fact that Leonardo da Vinci did the first quantitative friction measurements, um, it is, there are still people publishing on friction today. And so I think making it, making the students realize it's, it's very, physics is alive uh, very much, even the stuff that's old. Um, but it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a balance. And um, I, I'm sorry you didn't have a more, fun, more entertaining experience. <laughs> um, but, uh, but and, and, and actually, the other thing also, when teaching classical mechanics, which all of this is classical mechanics, it's first semester physics, you know, plus a little bit, but it's, you know, it's, it is, in, uh, you know, what I do is classical mechanics, professional, and some statistical mechanics, but the, um, and so I think also we make some effort to pair professors who, we all rotate through, all, in principle, all the classes, but I'm more likely to teach more of the stuff that's closer to my research field because I can bring it to life more. So, um, and I'm less likely to teach quantum mechanics despite having taken five courses in quantum mechanics in my life because it's just not what I do. Um, it's interesting, it's fascinating, but it's not what I do. So anyway, hopefully that touches on uh, a few things anyway. And happy to chat with you all at, in the break here that's to come. Thank you.